Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. So glad all of you are here today. If you're a first or second time guest, let me say we are happy to have you today. My name is Phil Ortigo. I serve as a senior pastor here at Scotts Hill. Those of you who are watching us online, we want to give a shout out to you as well. Thank you for inviting us into your home, maybe your hotel room, maybe at work, wherever you are. We're, thanks for the opportunity for us to join you as we declare together the great things of God. And I want to give a special shout out to a group of people who are in Jeffrey. Bay, South Africa. Every Tuesday, they meet together in a home and they watch our services online. And there they have a Bible study together after that. And they've invited me to come and check out our new church plant in South Africa. <laughs> and so I'm looking forward to an opportunity to go and do that sometime. But I want you to welcome them. Tuesday morning, they're going to be watching this. So I want them to hear from you. So on the count of three, I want you to say hi, y'all. You ready? One. One, two, three. Hi, Look forward to speaking with you guys again. Well, I love reading about churches and through my um, ministry, I've read about a number of different churches that just um, have done wonderful things all around um, our community and even around the world. I was reading about a little rural church in Huntsville, Texas. The name of the church is New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Now, this little church is out in the middle of nowhere. It's a very rural church and it's a very small church. Well, they had several years ago a difficulty of meeting their bills and their responsibilities and their obligations. They couldn't hardly pay for their electricity, couldn't pay for their pastors. So somebody had an idea, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we have a fundraiser? And we can have a fundraiser and people in the community can help us out and help support the ministries of our church. So somebody had the idea and said, hey, we're good at cooking and we're good at barbecue. So they established a outreach of developing barbecue and selling it to their community. It went over so incredibly well that the people who came and purchased their barbecue asked them, would you continue doing this? Our community can keep supporting you and we'll keep coming because your food is really good. And so they decided, yes, we can do this. And so every Friday and Saturday, they made a commitment that they would start serving barbecue to the community. They took their fellowship hall and they converted it into a makeshift restaurant, complete with the decor, with the menus and everything. And people started coming from everywhere. I mean, they loved their food. The food was incredible. I mean, ribs and chicken and steak and pork and all of these kinds of things. It became so popular that people all across Texas was traveling to Huntsville, Texas to come and eat the barbecue from New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. In fact, the church was renamed. The people in the community now call it the Church of the Holy Smoke. That's what it's called. And for the past 30 years, this church has converted its fellowship hall and all of its efforts to serving the people. It is ranked number 17 out of the 100 restaurants on Yelp in that area. And while we might applaud their entrepreneurial spirit, and while we might even say, you know, that was a really clever thing that they've done, New Zion Missionary Baptist Church has developed spiritual amnesia. They forgot who they are. And you see, instead of serving up the gospel, they spend all of their time serving up meat from beef and chicken and pork. And what they've done, instead of being concerned about souls, they're concerned about reviews for Yelp. And they've missed it. And you know, we can look at it and say, yeah, that's not really good what they did. But there are a lot of churches across the United States and the world that have developed the same kind of spiritual amnesia and they've forgotten who they are. Some churches exist for entertainment and people come together every week and they're entertaining. They leave there and they say, wow, wasn't that a great service? Some churches are, are, are for social gatherings. Wasn't it a wonderful time for us to spend together this Sunday? Some churches are for the rituals and, and, and maybe um, the nostalgia of the past. Some churches are for becoming like the culture so that the culture might like Jesus. And all along the way, we can see that we can miss it. And we wonder, how do we get here? 
And when churches become like that and they lose sight of all of that, they get sucked into the philosophies of the culture. And let me tell you, this has been going on for a long time. Matter of fact, there have been a number of enemies that have been coming against the church for the past 30 years. Let me give you the three major enemies that have been attacking our culture and infiltrating themselves into the body. The first one is postmodernism. Postmodernism declares that there is no absolute truth and all truth is relative and determined by the individual. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And there's no objective truth to guide us in anything. And postmodernism tell us that all things are relative. But did it move from postmodernism to pluralism? This affirms the independent validity of every faith and ideology and any attempt to convert someone to their point of view is to be faced with intolerance. There's no longer one truth and there's no longer one way. There are multiple ways and Christianity is no longer exclusive through a relationship with Jesus Christ to the Father. And as a result, pluralism exists in our culture. But then that leads us to where we are today, progressivism. And progressivism is a radical attempt to deconstruct and reform the norms, values, and the morals of a society. And we are now in this progressive stage in our culture today where there is this deconstruction, there's the removal of the norms of our culture and it's infiltrating our churches. Let me just tell you how it's impacted our churches. You know, the majority of Christians today no longer hold to a biblical worldview and they hold to no absolute truth. Do you know the majority of Christians today believe that, that Jesus is not the only way to get to heaven anymore? That there are multiple ways that you can find your path to heaven? Do you know today that many churches have embraced every kind of lifestyle and to speak against it in any way is to be harmful and therefore to embrace everything that the culture offers? What happens when a church becomes like that? The church is filled with ungenerated people. It's, it, it's, it's, it's led by unqualified pastors and it has no power in a message. And what we see is these things have been infiltrating our church in the body for a long time. So the question comes, what do we do about this? How do we get here? And what we need desperately is somebody who can give us some information that's specifically for the church. We need instruction. We need guidance. We need to go back and see what is it that God's intention is for his body. We are an outpost of heaven with ambassadors of Christ who are called to share the good news to a world that desperately needs to be redeemed. How do we do that? Where do we go to look for that? Well, fortunately, God has given us his word. And God has given us a great revelation all through his word. And one of the places that we're going to go for the next 14 weeks is to look at what God's word has to say about the church and what is for the church. And so we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy, the epistle that Paul writes to his young protege, Timothy, And we're going to look in that passage and in that that, that letter to see what God says we are to be as the body of Christ. Now, we're going to take the next 14 weeks to do a deep dive into this letter. And it's a very significant letter. 1 Timothy was written by Paul, who also wrote Titus, and 2 Timothy, and those three together are considered the pastoral epistles. And Paul is writing to these young pastors to give them specific instruction about the church. But in 1 Timothy, it is the clearest instruction that we have in Scripture on how the church should function and how we should act. And the, and, and the main purpose of that letter, Paul spells it out in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And here's what he says. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. 
If we look at this major purpose, there are three goals that Paul gives to Timothy and to the church. The whole letter, six chapters, are based upon these three things. Number one, to guard the gospel. He says, guard the gospel three times in his letter. Chapter one, verses one through 11, which we'll look at today. It ends in, in, with that in chapter six, verse 20. And right in the middle of it, chapter four, is about guarding the gospel. Guarding the gospel is one of the most significant things that we are called to do as a body of Christ. But not only are we to guard the gospel, is to govern the church. He tells us how the church is to be governed in chapter three. And when we get to chapter three, we'll look at elders and deacons and the leadership of the church and how important that is and how they are called to function. But then he tells us to guide godly behavior. In chapter two, he speaks of godly behavior. In chapters five and six, he tells us about godly behavior. So everything we look at in the next several weeks, 14 weeks to be exact, we're going to be building around these things, guarding the gospel, governing the church, guiding godly behavior. So where do we begin today? Take your Bibles, open to 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And we're going to go to the first 11 verses today. And where does Paul start? Of all the places he can start in instructing the church what we are to do, and how we are to behave, he begins with the instruction of guarding the gospel against counterfeit Christianity. I mean, he wastes no time. He gets right into it and says, you are to guard the gospel against a counterfeit Christianity. Now, before we jump in, let me give you the context. Paul is writing from Macedonia to Timothy, who's in Ephesus. Paul left Timothy in Ephesus, and in Acts chapter 20, Paul leaves Ephesus for Jerusalem. Paul gets arrested, and he is sent to Rome, and he is under house arrest. The book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest, but somewhere along the way, the apostle Paul is released from that prison, and he finds his way to Macedonia. And while he's in Macedonia, he writes 1 Timothy and Titus. We don't know everything that Paul was doing in Macedonia, but apparently he was rearrested again. Then he was put in prison in Rome, and this time he did not get out. He was executed by Nero. But before he was executed, he wrote his last letter, 2 Timothy, to Timothy. These three pastoral epistles are the last letters written by the apostle Paul. And when Paul is writing to Timothy in this, he is writing to Timothy for the church. So when we look at this text, he's writing to all of us. And he begins by telling us that we are to guard the gospel, especially against counterfeit Christianity. Verses one through 11, follow along with me. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart a good conscience, and in sincere faith. Certain persons from swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Let's pray. Father, guide us this morning as we look at this. And as the Apostle Paul instructs us by your Holy Spirit in how we as the church 
are to be guarded against counterfeit Christianity. Father, may you speak to our hearts this morning and that we as your body and as your people would give obedience to what you're calling us to. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we guard against counterfeit Christianity? The Apostle Paul gives us three specific essentials for guarding against counterfeit Christianity. The reality is it's going to come. Timothy is in Ephesus, and Ephesus is filled with pagan idolatry and perverted worship of every kind. And so the Apostle Paul, speaking to Timothy and to the church, gives them the very first essential. Here it is. The church is to recognize a spiritual chain of command. You see, before we can ever deal with anything that's contrary to the gospel, we have to understand that the body has to operate with a very clear spiritual chain of command. And the Apostle Paul, every letter he writes, he goes right to the issue of spiritual authority, spiritual leadership, and spiritual fellowship. Those things have to exist in a church if we're going to function as God designed it to function. And there are several commands in here. Let me give them to you. First of all, there's a command from God to Paul. Verse one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. The apostle Paul is saying is this, I have been called by God. I was commanded by God. I have a royal commission. That's what that word command means. I have a royal commission from God to be an apostle. Now, this is an apostle in the strictest sense. There were only a handful of apostles, those who saw the resurrected Jesus and received a commission from him with the message of the gospel. After the apostle Paul, there were no more apostles in the strictest sense. But in a general sense, all believers are apostles because we're all sent. And here's what Paul is saying. I didn't choose this vocation. God called me into it. And God commanded me to do it. If you remember in Acts chapter nine, Paul is on his way to Damascus to persecute and execute Christians. He hated Jesus. He hated the church. He hated believers. And yet on the way, he encounters the Lord Jesus. And in the midst of that comes the conversion and his calling to be an apostle. The first thing we see is a command to Paul to be a, a, an apostle and a communicator of the gospel. But here's the second one. It's a command from God and Paul to Timothy. He says, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. The same way Timothy receives a call from God in the same way, but as a pastor, not as an apostle, but as a pastor, and God calls him. Timothy was about 15 to 17 years old when he came to faith in Christ. Most likely, he came to faith in Christ under the teaching of the apostle Paul. Now, Timothy's father was a Greek. His mother was a Jew. And apparently, his father either died or he abandoned the family because Timothy was raised by his grandmother and his mother. And let me just say, single moms, grandmothers, thank you so much for your influence in our lives as you are working diligently to train your children in godly ways. But he was trained by those two. But somebody recommended him to Paul. And Paul saw his outstanding nature and his outstanding character. And so what happens is God commissions Timothy by calling him into the ministry. Paul sees him, brings him with him, pours into him. And he calls him his true child in the faith, which means legitimate. He is legitimate in his faith, legitimate in his authenticity as a believer. And so what does Paul do? He takes him on his trips. But we know this about Timothy too. Timothy was kind of an uh, um, intim intimidated young man. He was a young man that was probably introvert. He was very timid. He was easily discouraged. He was one that was fearful. He was young. And he also had some kind of sickness because Paul tells him later in this letter that you need to take a little wine for your stomach. And all good Baptists are really happy to hear about that for medicinal purposes, right? And so anyway, what happens is he is, um, he, he is encouraged by Paul and Paul instructs him as well. Paul says to remain in Ephesus. Ephesus. 
Why does he tell him to remain? Because he knows the tendency of Timothy. Timothy's afraid. He's fearful. He's timid. He's easily intimidated. He's in a difficult place to serve. And Paul says, remain. Don't bail on me, Timothy. Fulfill your calling. Live out the ministry that God has given to you there in Ephesus. We know that Timothy stayed because tradition says that Timothy was beaten to death by a mob when he was speaking against their patron goddess, Diana, of all of her perversions. So here's where we see. There's a call from God to Paul. There's a call from God and Paul to Timothy. But look at this. There's a call from Timothy to the body. It goes on. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so you may charge certain persons. Timothy, as a pastor, it is your responsibility to charge them. The word charge is the word in Greek which refers to a military term that says to give strict orders to as from a superior officer. And so here's the picture that Paul is painting. He's painting this picture to the church. What you have to understand is both Timothy and I have been called by God. We have been equipped by God. We have been called to pastor and oversee the work of the church in Ephesus. And you as the body of Christ are to recognize our calling and you are to support the leadership that God has given. But you also hold us accountable. Because in chapter five, verse 17, Paul says to the body, you are to honor your leaders, but you are to hold them accountable in areas where they may be falling. So here is the chain of command. Let me give it to you. Jesus is the great shepherd. Let me say something. This is not your church. It's not my church. It's not the elders' church. The church belongs to Jesus This is his bride. He is the shepherd. He is the head. He is in charge. Many years ago when I was doing um, um, upward basketball, I never told the kids that I was the pastor of this church. They never knew I was the pastor. And none of the kids on the team came to this church. And the night of the ceremony, they called me up here to pray and they introduced me as Pastor Phil. Afterwards, this little kid comes up to me. He says, you own this church? I said, no, Jesus owns this church. He is the good shepherd. He is the head of the body. But pastors are called and gifted as shepherds and overseers. The pastors of this church have been called by God, set apart to, for the purpose of guarding, guiding, and governing the life of the church. And we have been set apart by God as the leaders responsible to him and servants to you. But here's the third part, members. Members are followers of Jesus and servants of Christ, but they trust him for the pastors submitting to their leadership and holding pastors accountable in the life of the body. Let me tell you, when this works according to scripture, then what happens is the body of Christ is strengthened. The body of Christ has clear direction. The body of Christ is walking with holiness and purity. The body of Christ is encouraging one another and holding each other accountable as we serve one another. When pastors are not following Jesus as the head, then the church becomes disrupted and confused. When pastors are not serving the members, then it becomes the CEO mentality where you listen to us. And when members are not following Christ or submitting to the leadership of the church, then the church becomes powerless. And there is no way that we can effectively carry out the work of the ministry that God has for us. And there's no way that we can detect and overcome counterfeit Christianity. So here's the first part, is seeing our role together as members of the body of Christ. And let me say this, if Jesus is not the head of a body, a body without a head is a corpse. 
And he is always to be in charge as the elders walk under him as under shepherds and serving the people. And together we entrust God and one another to walk clearly together. Our elders at Scott's Hill are absolutely committed to following Jesus and to serving you. Our elders at Scott's Hill Baptist Church, our pastors are absolutely committed to being under shepherds and not CEOs of the body. And our elders at Scott's Hill are absolutely committed to be under your watchful eye with you holding us accountable to godliness and to holiness. And this is what God has called the church to be. And this is how we are to walk. There must be a clear understanding of spiritual chain of command. But here's the second thing Paul says. If we're going to overcome counterfeit Christianity, the church is to confront false teachers and false doctrine. We're called to confront false teachers and false doctrine. Now, let me make something very clear here. False teachers and false doctrine are those teachers and doctrine that move away from the general teaching and the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not that people might have different opinions about the interpretation of a passage. It's not that a person might have a different opinion about the interpretation of the role of deacons and how does that work out. Those are not the things we're talking about. We're talking about drifting away from the mainline teaching of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. And when there are people in the life of the church who are doing that, we together as a body are to confront them. Notice what Paul says to Timothy. Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach a different doctrine. The different doctrine he's talking about is the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the message of the gospel, the doctrine of the basic truths of God's word about redemption and his plan for all of humanity. That's what he's talking about. And he's saying that you gotta pay attention to them. And, and Paul knew they were coming because in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30, before he left the church in Ephesus to go to Jerusalem, he said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among you, our own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. He says within you, and he names him in verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander. These two men were creating divisions in the church. They were drawing people after themselves and they were false teachers. Here's what Paul is saying, that we have to be vigilant because here's what's at stake. The message of the gospel is at stake. And as a body of Christ, we need to so guard the message of the gospel because we're passing this down to the next generation. And they're passing this down to their next generation. And they're passing this down to their next generation. And at any point, if we allow the message of the gospel to be distorted and unclear or led away from the truth, then generations of people will be misled and their faiths will become shipwrecked. This is the charge that we have. So the question is, how do you spot false teachers? How do we know if somebody's teaching falsely? Paul gives four characteristics of false teachers in this passage. Let me give them to you. The four characteristics. False teachers often present new insights that are not supported by sound doctrine. Here's how he puts it. He says, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths, endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. There's some people that'll find little new, new little words, new little obscure sayings. Here's what the people were doing there. The Jews in this church were looking at the genealogies of famous people through the Old Testament. And they were, they were creating these fanciful tales about them. Or they were creating these myths about angels and how many angels can fit on the head of a pen and stuff like that. And people were speculating. They were spending all their time asking questions and being pulled away from the truth of the gospel. There are people today who love to find a little word, a little obscure phrase, and they say, hey, listen to this. And I want to tell you three of them that's happening in our culture today. It's happened particularly among our high school students and our college students. 
One of those is what we would call contemplative praying. Contemplative praying is like when you pray to the point where you kind of like leave your body and it's an out of the body experience. And this is being taught among many people in churches, which is not according to sound doctrine. And there's another one called manifestation. And this manifestation is you say certain things and you think certain things. And if you say them and think them, then your thoughts control your destiny. And then your life is controlled by your thoughts and your words and they become manifest in your life. Just positive confession, which is not sound doctrine. And then how about this one? Let's, let's reconstruct our faith. Now, some of our faith may need to be reconstructed because we build monuments. But this whole thing of tearing it down because you know what? The words of Jesus are too harsh. When he talks about sin, that's too harsh for our culture. So we need to deconstruct all this and make it very easy and loving for people to accept the message of the gospel. These are people who are adding new things that all they do is create questions. Here's the second mark. False teachers often avoid biblical truths that expose their error. While they're teaching, if they come to a biblical truth, they get around it. I love the way Paul said it. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion. I love the word swerve. There's a picture of this. It is a very aggressive act of trying to get around something. It's like you driving down Market Street and somebody loses a two by four out in the middle of the road. And when you come right up on it, what do you do? You swerve around it to miss it. And this day with the cost of lumber, you stop and pick it up and you sell it. <laughs> but you swerve around it because it's in your way. The picture is false teachers always swerve around truth. When you bring the doctrine or you bring the word of God to them, they'll swerve around it because they want to avoid it at any cost. And he calls it vain discussion. The King James calls it vain jangling. I like that, vain jangling. Their message is just jangled up. I guess that's the 17th century version of saying, man, they're jacked up. I mean, it's kind of like that. But they swerve around the truth. And you can always see a false teacher when he does that. Thirdly, false teachers are often motivated by pride desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make a certain um, uh, confident assertions. These are the people who want people to come to them. And they make assertions very strongly that make you think they know what they're talking about, but they don't. But they always draw people and they use things like this. Hey, you know what? Those people over there are pretty shallow. I'm deep. You need to listen to me. Or, hey, let me tell you something that most people don't know, but God revealed this to me, and I'm going to tell it to you. And they draw people aside because it's all about them. Here's the fourth thing. False teachers misuse the word of God. Here's the most deadly of all of them. False teachers will misuse the word of God. They use it, but they misuse it. They misquote it. What was happening in a church in Ephesus were a group of Jewish people who were there and they were misusing the concept of the law of God. Here's how Paul says it. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. You see, those people were saying this. Listen, the law is good, but, and Jesus is good, but it's not enough just to have Jesus. You see, you can follow Jesus, but you've got to have the law too. And the law refers to the Mosaic law, which was the 10 commandments, but the religious leaders wanted to protect the 10 commandments, so they created 612 around the 10 commandments. And so they're like picket fence around the 10 commandments. And the goal was to try to apply all of these to your life. And the person who does all of these laws and these rituals are the people who are most spiritual. But the truth is this, none of them can ever attain it because they didn't understand the purpose of the law. The law was never given to make a person righteous or holy. The law was given to show that we cannot be righteous and holy. That's the purpose of the law. 
The purpose of the law was to show us how we so easily fall. Paul says this in Romans chapter seven. He says that if it were not for the command, you shall not covet, I wouldn't even know that I covet. Let me give you an illustration. How many of you have ever seen a sign on a wall that says wet paint, don't touch? How many of you? How many of you touched it? How many of you wanted to touch it? You know what that law does? It arouses sin within you and demonstrates the disobedience and unrighteousness of our hearts. And false teachers, in this case, will use the word of God as some means of saying, Jesus is not enough. It's got to be something else. So, how do you combat this? Paul says in verse five, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You can always know good, solid, biblical teaching from these things. It comes from love, a love for God and a love for others. Biblical sound teaching always first seeks to honor and glorify God and it always secondly seeks the good of others. Whether it's a strong command or comforting command. You see, true biblical teaching is always focused on honoring God and benefiting other people who hear it. But not only is it love, it's a pure heart. Now, our hearts are not pure because of sin, but this is talking about a heart that's been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. It's a heart whose passions are for God, whose heart is consumed with the person of Jesus Christ, whose heart wants to walk in the obedience of the Holy Spirit. And when people walk and teach in that manner and you see that, you know that's coming from God. Here's the third thing, a good conscience. The word conscience comes from two words, co-knowledge. It's co-knowledge. It is your moral knowledge that you know that God has put into your heart, but his divine revelation that he has given to you. And so you apply both of those together and you walk in a good conscience, having been stirred by the revelation of truth of God's word. And you teach that. Here's the last one, a sincere faith. The word sincere means without cracks. It means no hypocrisy. It means it's a picture of a person who is authentic. It's a person who loves Jesus, who loves the word, who loves people. And in their good conscience, they're seeking to do everything they can to teach God's word rightly for his glory, not my good. And you can always tell that kind is biblically sound and honoring to God. That's the kind of teaching that we expose, we, we display here at Scotts Hill. And if we're going to be the church that God calls us to be, we walk in that truth and we carefully listen to any dangerous lies that may be from the enemy. Now, there's a, da there's a danger here. And the danger is this. God's not calling us to be the spiritual police people of everybody. He's calling us to walk in obedience and encourage one another to do so. And always being careful of the lies that want to infiltrate the church from the enemy himself. So, if we're gonna be the kind of church God wants us to be, there has to be a chain of command that God places. And we walk according to that. There has to be the willingness to confront false teaching in the life of the church. But here's a third thing. The church must remain centered on the glorious gospel. This is the best place to end, to be centered on the glorious gospel. We should never move away from the message of Christ. We should never weaken the message of Jesus Christ. We should never water down the reason that Christ came. We should always hold the glorious gospel. In verse 11, Paul says, in accordance with the gospel of glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And if you're a child of God, you are entrusted with the message of the gospel. And the message of the gospel is simply this, that you and I cannot save ourselves. 
You and I cannot work our way out of the situation we're in. You and I cannot be good enough to measure up to the holiness of God. You and I need a savior. He's the only one who can rescue us. Two weeks ago, I was watching on television as Houston, Texas was flooded with flash floods. Some of you may have seen that. And and as they were showing this one section, there was a car that was caught up in the current and it was floating, but it was about to go down an embankment. And there was a lady who was hanging out the window screaming for help. She couldn't stop the car. She couldn't get out. She couldn't help herself. So as she's screaming for help, this man comes running in the water. He tries to slow the car down because it's about to go over. He can't stop the car. It's caught in the flow. And so he grabs this woman. He pulls her out of the window of a car and the car goes down and he carries her to safety. That is the picture of the gospel. Because you and I are in the car. You and I are helpless. You and I can do nothing for our own salvation. And it's not until the Lord Jesus comes along and pulls us out of that disastrous situation and saves us. And we are to remember that. We are to preach the gospel every day to ourselves to remind ourselves of the great work of Jesus and what he's done in my life. We are to preach the gospel every single day to one another as we declare what Jesus has done in our lives. We are to preach the gospel every single day to people in our community and let them know the incredible love of the Father who has sent his Son to deliver them from a state that they can never save themselves in. That's the glorious gospel. And Paul puts it this way in verse 15 of the same chapter. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of which I am the foremost. So if we're gonna stand against counterfeit Christianity, the first thing to do is to recognize the leadership and the chain of command that God has given to us for the church. Secondly, we are to confront dangerous lies and false teaching for the church. And we are to remain centered in the message of the gospel regardless of where our culture is going for the church. So let me give you five things quickly in closing. Instructions for Scott's Hill. Leaders, follow Jesus. He is our head. Submit to him. Members, follow Jesus and trust your leaders and pray for them. Encourage them. Hold them accountable so that we might be the kinds of under-shepherds that please the heart of Christ. All of us filter everything in sound biblical doctrine. Fourthly, all pursue love, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And lastly, Preach the gospel to ourselves and others. This is for the church. This is where we have to start. Why? Because every single day we are inundated by the lies of culture, the lies of an enemy called the devil. And he wants to distract us from the main theme of the message of Christ. Somebody said a long time ago, we must keep the main thing the main thing. And we pursue the message of the gospel. Next week, we're going to see in depth the impact of the gospel in people's lives as we look at what Paul says in the rest of chapter one. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Read through 1 Timothy every day. Pick up the passage, read through it, and see what God is saying for the church. And let's get ahead in that reading. We're going to have a reading plan that we're going to have online for you to join with us in. But this is what God is calling us to do. This is for the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the message this morning. And Father, I know that there's some here who may not have trusted Christ as their Lord and their Savior. They may be trusting all the things of the world, 
And yet Jesus is the only hope for them. And I pray, Father, that during this series that they would come to understand the truth of who Jesus is. And they would come into a relationship with him. Father, I pray for those who are members of this church that as we walk together and as we listen to what your word says for us, that we would walk according to such truth. Father, I pray that this bride, your bride, Scotts Hill Baptist Church, would be the example in this area of a church that's deeply in love with Jesus, a church that desires to share the gospel with its community, and a church that is effectively the light of its community. Father, may you challenge us in the days ahead. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.